So here we're going to do two things. First, we're going to talk about how probable metastability is. If metastability is such an improbable situation, then we shouldn't really worry about it that much. Secondly, we're going to talk about whether when a circuit enters metastability, how long does it take for it to exit it? Because if it can exit it really quickly, then that's good. If it takes it a long time to exit it, then that's a much worse situation. Knowing these two facts will allow us to design solutions for metastability. So let's start by talking about how often metastability is likely to happen. Here we are assuming that we have a transmitter uh, producing data at the clock, clock one, and a receiver receiving at the clock T2 with a period of T2, and that clock one and clock two are completely independent from each other. Now, the period of the second clock of the receiver clock is T2, but there is a window around the clock edge where if the data comes or is produced out of the first clock, clock one out of the transmitter, there will be metastable sampling in the second register. This window is T hold after the edge of clock two and T set up before the edge of clock two, so that we have a window T metastability equal to T setup plus T hold. Now, because clock one and clock two are independent, the instance at which data arrives from the output register of the transmitter, recall that the transmitter is producing data at clock, clock one, and the receiver is receiving it at the clock, clock two. The instance at which the data comes from clock one forms a uniformly distributed random variable relative to clock two. This comes from the fact that the two clocks are completely independent. So the data is li as likely to come here as it is to come here, as it is to come at any point within the period of clock two. This means that the probability that we will have metastability when sampling in register two is equal to Tm over T2, because data is likely to come in uh, any point equally likely to come at any point as it is in any other point. This is the, period, the, the, the window of time where metastability happens, and this is our entire window of time. So this is the probability that we will have metastability. Now, another statistic that we really care about is the rate at which metastability happens. So data is produced out of clock one at the rate of uh, one over T1 which is F1. So register one is producing data at the rate of F1. Each of the samples it produces has a probability of being metastable of Tm over T2. This means that the rate of metastability when sampling in register R2 is Tm over T2. This is the probability of metastability multiplied by the rate at which data is produced out of clock one. So this is then Tm over T1, T2. And this is measured in instances per second. Now let's use numerical values to find out if this phenomenon is actually something that happens often. Um, a typical value for Tm would be 10 picoseconds. Uh, T1, let's use 2 nanoseconds and T2, 1 nanosecond. These are actually favorable values, values that do not give us high metastability, but let's just use them and see how uh, often metastability happens. So the rate of metastability calculated using these values is five per microseconds. This means that you will have five metastable samplings every single microsecond in the receiver. Each of them is a failure. Recall, if you sample in a metastable fashion, that's a setup time violation or a whole time violation. And this is a failure. This means that the data that you received is incorrect and there's no way to retrieve it. One statistic that is really interesting is MTBF or mean time between failures. Mean time between failures is the reciprocal of the rate of failure. Because metastability is failure, then R, the rate of metastability, is the rate at which failures happen. MTBF is the reciprocal. 
if R has a value of instances per second, then MTBF has a value, has a unit of, of seconds, of time. It has a dimension of time. And it is exactly what its name says. It is the average time that passes between each two failures. And if we calculate it from the five, per five failures per microseconds, it gives us a time of 0.2 microseconds. What this means, in short, is that if a failure occurs, failure due to metast metastability, let's say, and you say, okay, this is a failure due to metastability, I'm gonna accept it and live with it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna restart the system, I'm gonna reset it and forget that the metastability happened and let the system work again. How much time will pass before another failure occurs? And the answer is 0.2 microseconds. So if you decide to live with the fact of metastability and just reset the system whenever it occurs, you have to reset the system every 0.2 microseconds. And that is obviously not practical. So this actually tells us how we are going to solve metastability. Because if you can raise the mean time between failures to a very high value, then you have basically solved metastability. You will not solve metastability by completely getting rid of it, but you will solve it by making it so rare that it's basically not going to happen. So the second part of the solution is to look at how long it takes a register to get out of metastability. In specific, we are concerned about the master latch in the register. And these are the two inverters of the master latch. In the last video, we talked about how if they are metastably latching or sampling, um, they're going to be caught in the high gain region, in the transition region. They, we know that they leave the high gain region fast simply because it has a high gain. But we want to find out how fast because this figures into our solution. So the inverters in the high gain region are acting as amplifiers. That's because both of their transistors are in the saturation region. So each of the inverters is acting as an amplifier. And that amplifier has a uh, transconductance um, of GMN plus GMP. So it has a transconductance that is the summation of the transconductances of their two transistors. Now, if we write a KCL equation at points X and QI, then the current going into these amplifiers is going to be the current coming out of the uh, total capacitance at this node. Recall that these are inverter gates, uh, so they have uh, very high impedance and their capacitance is already taken into consideration in this value C. So this will give us minus GM VX equals C DVQI by DT. And similarly, minus GM VQI is equal to C DVX by DT. There's a, there's a, um, a negative sign because when the voltage is positive, this turns on the NMOS transistor, which sinks current rather than sources it, and vice versa for the PMOS. Now, uh, if we subtract these two equations, they will give us a differential voltage, so that GM into Vx minus Vqi is equal to minus C dVx minus uh, Vqi by dt. And let's just call this voltage Vd, meaning it's the differential voltage. And let's also uh, talk about the C over GM as a time constant, because one over GM is a resistance. It's the small signal uh, resistance of the inverters, which is not something we had to talk about, except maybe when we talked about sense amplifiers, because it's a, an analog thing, right? So uh, that gives us a differential equation, which is, um, which is in a form that we can deal with. Uh, Vd is equal to minus tau into dVd by dt. This is a first order differential equation, which is actually the uh, equation for an RC circuit. And it gives us a solution. Vd is equal to the initial value of Vd, Vd of zero, e to the power of t over tau. So the uh, 
the voltage, the differential voltage between the nodes X and QI will increase exponentially. Uh, so that exponential growth is controlled by the time constant tau, which promotes a high gain, high transconductance in the inverters and low capacitance within the register, which is something we would already have to do in order to reduce delay. Now, you might be, you might be wondering how this voltage is going to increase exponentially when the maximum either side could go to is supply voltage. I mean, what's the uh, out? What's the exit from this situation? The exit is when node QI reaches VDD and node X reaches zero volt or node QI reaches zero volt and node X reaches VDD. So the exit is when one side reaches the supply and the other reaches ground. So the answer is the exponential growth happens only until the two inverters exit the high gain region, at which point this equation is no longer valid because uh, one of the transistors is going to exit the saturation region. But once we reach the low gain region, we can actually say that metastability has ceased to occur. So we see that these guys are actually, uh, this voltage is actually increasing quickly, which begs a, uh, to ask a question. Why are you worried about metastability so much if we exited so quickly? Now, there are two answers to this. Let's first uh, express this equation in terms of uh, T. Let's make T the time our, our, uh, like our uh, main variable here. And so that's going to be tau len VD by VD of zero. As I said, an exit from this would happen when VD is equal to VDD. So the time to exit metastability is equal to tau len VDD over VD of zero. Now, this time is extremely dependent on VD of zero, more so actually than the time constant, which means that how long it takes to exit is going to be very dependent on how much metastability there is. If the two inverters are caught very close to each other and very close to the metastable point, it will take them longer to exit. But far apart from each other, much less time. So it really depends on VD of zero, which is a random variable here. It's not something that you can control. So yes, it could, we, could take, we could ostensibly take a very long time to exit metastability. But the other thing is, any additional delay that you take to exit metastability is delay that was not taken into consideration when calculating the, uh, the period of the receiver uh, clock. So that means that there will be a failure in that pipeline, regardless of how short a time it takes to exit metastability. Now, because the voltage difference increases exponentially, the probability that we are still metastable after a time t has passed after sampling decreases exponentially. It has an exponential distribution and this it decreases uh, at the rate of e to the power of minus t over tau, which means that the probability that we enter metastability but are still metastable after a time of t is the probability that two things have happened, that we have entered metastability, which has a probability of Tm over T2, and that after a time T has passed, we are still metastable, which has a probability of E power minus T over tau. Now, if we assume that at the receiver, we are not going to look at the data until a full cycle has passed, right? So what, what is this probability? That means that T small is equal to T2. That's a period of the receiver clock. And the probability in this case becomes Tm over T2 e to the power of minus T2 over T over tau. Now, this leads to a uh, rate of metastability of uh, Tm over T1, T2, e to the power of minus T2 over tau and a mean time between failure of um, the opposite, the reciprocal of this rate of metastability. So the question now is, if you wait a full cycle at the receiver before sampling, will this solve the problem? 
And to do this, we use typical values for uh, TM, T1, and T2, which are the same values we used at the beginning of the video. Let's just repeat them. TM is 10 picoseconds, T1 is 1 nanoseconds, T2 is 2 nanoseconds. And by the way, metastability is going to happen, excuse, excuse me, this is 2 nanoseconds and this is 1 nanoseconds, but metastability is going to happen regardless of which of the two uh, clocks is faster than the other. Also tau is 20 picoseconds. If we substitute for these values, we get a mean time between failure of 1.7 times 10 to the power of 20 billion years. That means that metastability has been solved because if you have to stop your system because metastability has occurred and you reset it and restart it, the, the, the time that will have to pass before another metastability happens is longer probably than the age of the universe. So that means that you don't have to deal with metastability ever. This is so unlikely that it doesn't even occur. So the answer to metastability is to wait a cycle at the receiver before we sample. That could have been a, a suggestion that we made from the very beginning, but we have to make sure that it actually solves the problem. The problem is solved because giving a cycle to the data to settle out of metastability is more than enough. How can we make sure? By looking at this number. Now we have to find systematic ways in which to do this. And in the next two videos, we're going to look at two very, very different ways of systematically avoiding metastability through hardware solutions.